Um, maybe I'll say a couple of words and then I'll hand uh, the floor, Zoom, mic, uh, you know, to the presenters. But obviously, um, yesterday we talked about Project Browser, uh, which is one of the core building blocks for Starshot. And today we're going to talk about Recipes, uh, which I hope many of you know, maybe not all of you. Um, but the goal really is to get you up to speed on what recipes are, uh, where we are with recipes in terms of readiness, and then where we're going next. And then a good chunk of the Zoom is, is really designed around getting you all up to speed on where help is needed and how you can contribute to the recipe initiative. And before I hand off the floor, I want to maybe just highlight how game-changing, I believe, the recipes initiative is and recipes in general. I really believe it will change the course of Drupal in a good way. Uh, I think it's differentiated and unique and very powerful uh, in that we can bundle up you know, best practices, knowledge that's in senior developers' brains that they've gained over years and years of working with Drupal. Now we can kind of bundle that up in a recipe and make available to many more people. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just think it's pretty amazing, uh, the idea of recipes. And so I'm excited about this uh, webinar. So hopefully you'll be too. Uh, we're gonna go through some slides and then just like yesterday, we'll finish with Q&A. So with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Jim and Alex and Adam and others. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I just posted in the chat, uh, but the slides are linked from the recipes channel of the Drupal Slack. Uh, if you haven't joined there yet, please do. And you can follow along and click on all of the informative links we have in this presentation. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we're all good. Okay. And then maybe, sorry, one more thing. If you have questions, uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A uh, section of Zoom or just in chat. And I'll, um, I'll try to kind of moderate them. And at the end, we'll go through the questions. So just wanted to mention that. Back to you, Jim. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no worries. All right. Uh, first, a little primer about what recipes are. Um, and what if recipes aren't. So uh, recipes are applied to Drupal. Uh, they are not installed. So this is a, a sea change from what everybody's used to with modules and themes. Um, that makes them easier to share. Uh, they don't lock sites in. Um, so one of the big problems we were trying to solve for with this initiative was install profiles and distributions locking you in for life and never being able to get away from them or taking a super skilled developer to get away from them. And they are composable from other Drupal recipes. Uh, so recipes can call other recipes to add even more functionality um, and they can be created at an extremely granular level um, to allow only you know, minute changes to a Drupal site. Uh, what recipes can do uh, is what we got added to Drupal core uh, in 10.3. Um, so the first thing that recipes can do is apply other recipes. Uh, then the next step is to install other packages, modules, and themes. Uh, it can create configuration and entities. Uh, the super magic is through config actions, it can alter existing configuration. So no more need for update hooks or magic to get into Drupal core and you know make it so uh, only admins can approve accounts. Um, it's one of my favorite features of recipes here. And then through the default content API, uh, recipes can import content. Um, so, you know, if you're installing a calendar recipe and you have an event type taxonomy, you can import the terms now you need for that uh, recipe. So what recipes can't do is contain or run any code. If your 
piece of functionality that you're trying to add to your site uh, needs code, needs an update hook, needs something special, uh, you can require a module to bring that code in. But recipes themselves do not have any code. Uh, because recipes are applied to Drupal and then they're gone with the wind, um, updating to later versions of the recipe isn't a possibility. Um, you know, there's just no connection between the recipe then as it is now because the site builder can change their own site. And then as a matter of uh, steadfast rules that we've established, uh, recipes can't delete or uninstall anything. Uh, recipes are meant to be uh, creative, not destructive. Um, we want to create additional functionality on the sites. We don't want to be able to damage a site by allowing uh, the deletion or uninstalling of, of things. Um, I mentioned earlier, as of Drupal 10.3, uh, four new recipes APIs were added to core as experimental, along with uh, the standard suite of recipes. Uh, so basically, Adam and a bunch of great developers worked to convert the standard uh, profile that was in Drupal core into recipes as our proof of concept to make sure that recipes could do everything uh, that Drupal core needed it to do. Um, and because of this, um, you know, we have a great proof of concept and we have a great foundation to build upon. Um, and then the APIs I mentioned, uh, config action, which is what alters config action, config checkpoint. Uh, this is a API that saves information about your configuration before and after a recipe gets applied, or could have a number of different purposes because it was built as a standalone thing. Uh, the default content API, uh, which was uh, taken from the default content contrib module, uh, and then the uh, recipe API, which depends on the default content, the action, and the checkpoint uh, APIs. So how does recipes fit into Starshot? Um, Gabor put uh, Starshot's mission in here. Uh, the result of Starshot will be a fast moving open source product that enables site builders without Drupal experience to easily create a new Drupal site and extend it with prepackaged recipes, um, all using the browser. It will guide site builders to install recipes for common use cases and innovate capabilities that are immediately useful for production. It will focus on getting people to install, uh, from install to launch really fast and will bring new people and contributors into Drupal and the open web. So recipes are a key building block to Starshot. Um, the first thing we need to work on is that recipes will be available during the installation process. Uh, and then the second big piece is that recipes will be discoverable and applicable, applicable uh, in project browser. Uh, the recipes that will be included in Starshot will be shareable and again, repeatable. Um, they will make Drupal easier to support once entities are standardized. Um, so I'm gonna demo a recipe that my agency has put together a little later. Um, you know, Adam built the Starshot prototype. There are a bunch of different agencies working with this. Once we have these Starshot, these you know, core recipes, um, you know, will we ever need to build another accordion again? I sure hope not. Um, so, you know, it'll help us do the hard things like integrating with Salesforce and connecting to APIs or making Drupal the API, you know, but we have, we never need to do that content modeling again, uh, unless somebody invents a, a new type of accordion, which would be great. Um, so, you know, the great thing is that the Starshot leadership will define what recipes go into the initial phase of Starshot, and they will work with contributors to build them. So these recipes will be created by Drupalists that have, you know, tons of years of experience creating best practices using, you know, the most common slash safest 
contrib modules we can um, and keeping them as, as lightweight and robust as possible. Um, pulled in the mockups uh, in case anybody hasn't seen them yet. These are the initial Starshot mockups. Um, so the first step of the installer um, shows a decision at applying a top level recipe that would contain a theme, I assume. Um, you know, so this recipe has the style printed out. Is it a corporate site? Is it a, a, a magazine site? Um, there's more ideas there. Um, so this would probably imply a theme and some function functionality that goes with it. And then in the next step, you can take uh, more uh, composable levels. Uh, so you know, Chris from Redfin has a great analogy of recipes are uh, meals and dishes and ingredients. Um, you know, maybe the magazine site recipe is the meal and these site functionality pieces are the dishes that go into the meals. Um, but there's going to be some options in the installer about which function, piece of functionality you want to install. So uh, we'll do a little demo of a recipe uh, and then uh, what's in a recipe and then we'll look at some videos because Adam was smart and suggested I not do a live demo. So this is the standard recipe in Drupal core. Um, it's a easy to read YAML file. Um, you see at the top, we have name, description, and the type. Uh, the type is a uh, ongoing issue that we have uh, to name things because everybody knows naming things is the funnest. Uh, the first thing this recipe does is install other recipes. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that recipes were composable and they can bring in other recipes. Um, we created the standard profile uh, to be very composable, you know, pulling in article comments, article tags, and the article content type. So technically you could pull in like an article content type without comments, or you could bring in a different theme than Claro. Um, so these are very uh, easy to use uh, and build upon in your own recipes. After it installs or applies recipes, it installs modules. So in this case, we're installing the core modules that we need. And then when recipes apply or recipes install modules, they don't necessarily import all the config. They import uh, the needed uh, configs or the, the configs that the module needs, um, but anything that's optional or anything that is not required, uh, you can pull in or not pull in. So in this instance, Adam's pulling in the only two image styles from the image module, because that's all we need in this recipe, rather than just the default uh, install of the module might pull in six image styles. Um, so that's one really great thing about Drupal uh, re recipes is that you can pull in uh, and be lean in your site and not have any cruft that you have to deal uh, delete later. So past the config import, you have the config actions. And config actions take a config file. So in this case, it's the node.settings.yaml. Um, we're using an action called simple config update. And it's a foo bar. We are just changing the admin, use the admin theme to true. Uh, System.site.yaml, we're changing the front page to slash node. Um, an even funner uh, and more dynamic uh, config action is the grant permission and then grant permission for each entity type. Um, so here we are on the authenticated role and the content editor role, we are setting permissions. And even on the anonymous role, we're allowing people to access content. Um, so this is a really great uh, example recipe that is in core. Um, to apply recipes, and we'll see this in the video in a minute, um, there is a script in Drupal core uh, called recipe. And you just have to 
add the path to the recipe. So this could be a contrib recipe or a recipe in core. Um, the only thing that is a requirement is that uh, if you do bring in contrib recipes, they all need to be in the same folder. Uh, and then from the installer, uh, so from Drupal's install or quick start script, you can also now install from recipes uh, instead of uh, install profile. All right, let's see if this works here. So this is using the quick start script to install from right, recipes. Use the uh, Drupal quick start script to install Drupal, uh, first using the minimal profile, uh, then using the standard uh, recipe set uh, that was added to uh, Drupal core in 10.3 and above. So the first thing we can do is run the quick start script and select minimal. See, it's pretty quick. It'll pop open a browser and you will see that there is a Stark theme is installed uh, under content. There are no content types yet. Um, very simple uh, site. So let's reset this. See a couple commands we need to run to reset. And then we can now install the core recipes standard recipe. Takes a little bit longer because we're installing a bunch of modules and configuring them. Uh, we'll pop this open now and we can see that we have the Olivero front end theme. We have the Claro back end theme. We have content types and even have comments, contact forms, taxonomies, etc. So if we reset one more time, we can use this to set again. And this time, let's run a much simpler recipe. This time, we're just going to install the article content. Uh, so don't have a lot to go on here, but let's go to slash admin. And if we go to content, actually, we'll have to go to structure content types, and then we can see that we have the article content type. Uh, this is just one of the building blocks that's in the standard recipe, um, but this just shows an example of how to apply different recipes and not just standards. All right, thanks, an hour ago, Jim. All right, next up, we're gonna apply a contributed recipe. All right, in this demo, we are going to install uh, Drupal using the minimal profile, uh, using Drosh. Uh, I'm using uh, Doxel in this demo. Uh, you may be familiar with DDEV or Lando, uh, basically uh, same thing when you look at them from space, uh, a wrap around Docker. Uh, now that Drupal is installed, we can open it in the browser and see uh, not much there, just the start theme as we'd expect here. Um, I have a helper command called recipe apply uh, that wraps around the recipe command. And I've required a large recipe uh, that we maintain called saplings that is going to install a suite of Drupal functionality for us. Uh, I'm running this on Drupal 10.2, uh, so we're not getting the uh, nice verbose output of what is happening when the recipe applies. That's in 10.3. Um, but if we wait just a minute, we will uh, get the new site uh, all installed uh, and everything. Um, this installs two content types, page and post, uh, and then configures them uh, fully. Uh, so what I mean fully is that it not only creates the content types, uh, media entities that are needed, paragraph uh, entities, uh, but it also creates menus. It creates meta tags for the entities. Uh, path auto is already created. Uh, so now if we go to the site, let's log in. And we'll find that we have the nice, beautiful admin theme, uh, Jin, set up. Uh, we have uh, settings here. Um, we'll go over to the meta tags I was talking about, and we can see for page content type, we have all the tokens set up that we need. 
same for the post. And we even have some schema.org data in there. Um, we can go over to URL aliases, go to the patterns. Uh, see that we already have the pattern set up. We have taxonomy terms, paragraph types, uh, basically everything we need to get started on a Drupal build. All right. So I wanted to include that to show how robust you can make your recipes. So it's not just installing a content type, it's everything that goes along with a content type can be configured too. So back here, uh, next up, I wanted to share an outline uh, documentation page we have uh, for the recipe project where anyone can add the recipes that they've been uh, creating. Um, Martin Manclu has been uh, converting his configuration kit modules to recipes. Um, we have big site starter recipes like I just demoed and one Durio and Kevin have uh, examples up there, functionality specific recipes, and then packages that uh, extend recipes also. So this is a way that we're, we've been using to you know, have kind of proof of concepts and show what other people are doing so we can all learn from each other until we have a solution for uh, Drupal.org to distribute recipes. Okay, so where are we going from here? Now that we have Drupal recipes in core, um, we're working on our phase two roadmap. So get over here. And we've broken these out into epics and each of the epics have uh, issues and we'll go through them one by one. So if anybody at home is playing along, check out 3446089. Uh, our first stack is uh, the, are, are the Starshot blockers. Uh, so there is a tag on Drupal.org because as you know, Starshot spans many different uh, projects. And there actually aren't that many blockers in the recipes uh, project itself. Right now, uh, we are having most of them in project browser. They are recipe related, uh, but the work is happening in the project browser. So keep an eye on the Starshot blocker uh, tag. Next up after that is Alex needs to work on the API documentation. So we'll just skip that. Um, but there's an issue uh, that we have some config actions called ensure exists and create. Um, and they're kind of little used, um, but they're a way maybe we can make recipes uh, more pliable and interoperable with other recipes. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been dreaming about these config actions for a couple of weeks now. It's terrible, terrible things. So, uh, so our first uh, big epic is to help end users find recipes on drupal.org, in project browser, and in the installer. Um, so we need to provide uh, UX ideas for browsing and installing recipes uh, to the drupal.org team uh, before we can even think about like technical solutions there. Um, how are people going to find recipes? What are they going to look for? Um, you may have heard yesterday in the project browser session, um, you know, that they had the idea of use cases. Um, it's kind of a really great example for what recipes are good for. Um, so this is an issue and a, a group of issues um, that we need help from everybody, UX designers, recipe creators, site builders, not just developers. Um, so there's some great issues in there. Um, there's even an issue for, you know, should recipes have interactive input, which really piqued Dries's mind and immediately thought of a wizard. You know, can we get an input from uh, a, a recipe applier uh, for an API key or for, contact addresses for the emails or or what languages do you want to install on the site? Um, so the, the possibilities are kind of endless there. Um, we want to improve the recipe 
application process. Um, so we want to handle that conflict I mentioned earlier, um, as recipes are written pretty strict these days. Um, how do we make them work with other recipes better? We want recipes to be able to be applied at any time in a Drupal site. Um, so not it's easy at the start when you know config is nothing or you expect config to be um, you know, pretty minimal. Um, but when you don't know what's going to happen, uh, you don't know what's config is already happening in a site, it's a little bit harder. Um, so that is more uh, of a developer task, and we need recipe creators and site builders there for testing. We want to extend the config checkpoints to allow recipes to be reverted. Um, so we have snapshots of configuration when uh, using that checkpoint API. Um, this Epic aims to extend that functionality to allow site builders to revert a application of a recipe. So I just installed the uh, landing page in Starshot. I don't feel like I need it. I could just you know, uninstall it, unapply it. Uh, we want to unpack recipes using Composer. Um, so we can require recipes using Composer. They're, they're just packages and uh, files, right? Um, but your site's core uh, composer.json file doesn't know about the dependencies that this recipe brought in. So a recipe can have a composer.json. If you bring that in, it brings in the dependencies. Um, but if you delete or, or get rid of that uh, recipe dependency after it applies, we need a way for the uh, dependencies to move to your site composer. Um, we do have a contributed solution for that that we want to uh, build upon and move into core. We want to make recipes work with composer better. Um, so we're gonna need to require recipes with composer. Right now we are uh, using the oomph installer to tell composer about uh, the recipes package type. Um, so we have a few smaller issues um, that are in the Drupal core realm and in the composer realm uh, that we want to address to make recipes first class citizens. We want to add and improve config actions. Um, so a lot of the config actions came from when uh, Adam and his team were building the standard uh, recipe um, for what they needed to do. Um, we have a really big issue uh, that uh, adds a lot of set commands uh, to the config actions. Um, so we want to be able to uh, place blocks and themes. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things uh, that are uh, actually needs review right now in our issue queue um, that could be added to make recipes even more powerful. We want to support automated tests of recipes. Um, you know, we have test coverage in core for what we have, but we can always have more. And uh, some of these tests should uh, extend to the config validation uh, efforts that are also going on in Drupal core. And then ongoing, we have always have bug fixes that config and recipe validation. Uh, we want to uh, put the additional core uh, profiles into recipes. So definitely Umami. Uh, we will learn a lot from that as it is a full-fledged demo site. Uh, and Minimal, which is, I'll quote Adam, as a nothing burger of a recipe or nothing burger of a profile. But uh, I think it's still important to have a, a tiny baseline. And then we've been trying to document everything as we go along the way. Um, would love uh, additional help there, uh, especially as new people are onboarding to the project uh, to um, you know, help us learn from what you're learning. And into the fun stuff here. So uh, we have a recipes channel of the Drupal Slack. Uh, I threw it out there earlier, it's where the slides are. We meet uh, twice monthly. Uh, we have Slack asynchronous meetings uh, that we we never close. So you can always come and follow up issues and uh, join the conversation no matter what time zone 
uh, you're in. Um, I link to the phase two roadmap. Um, we have a lot of the work happening still in our recipes initiative project page. So this initiative might be a little different from others that you've worked on where it's not just a module. Um, it is you know, part of Drupal core. So we can't just have a, an experimental module that we add to Drupal core. This project is actually a complete fork of Drupal core. Um, so we can always create issues here. And if they're small enough, uh, move them to Drupal core. Um, but we're maintaining this package uh, moving forward, this project moving forward, so we can have lots of you know, smaller commits, smaller issues that we can then bundle up and have a merge request back to core when some of the bigger pieces of functionality is completed. And then the documentation, uh, we keep it in the repository of that project on the 1.0.x branch. Uh, makes it easier for us to maintain and uh, conversate about, um, which is a great thing that was, you know, started two years ago uh, when Alex uh, started this initiative, which is a pretty, pretty great idea. And let's talk about the other Starshot initiatives. We have two more sessions, one this week and next. Uh, June 14th, we have Ted Bowman talking about automatic updates. It's the automatic updates update. I don't know if anybody said that out loud, but it's pretty fun. Uh, and then next week, we have Lori uh, talking about the experience builder. And I put links to all of the initiatives there. And thank you very much. And we can open up the floor to questions. And awesome. I haven't been paying attention to chat at all. Well, yeah, I can help a little bit with that. First of all, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, really, really exciting. And I hope people can see, um, you know, when I said it will be a game changer for Drupal, hopefully that became a little bit more obvious if it wasn't already uh, for many people. Uh, now, obviously, uh, before I jump into some of the, the questions here, um, you know, the, the demo was great. It was obviously using the command line. And one of the goals of Starshot is, you know, that end users don't have to use a command line. And so that's where a project browser comes in and where the work comes in that we plan to do on the installer. So hopefully having seen project browser webinar or Zoom and having seen this one, you can start to picture how we need to involve the installer so that you we launch people into project browser and then they can select recipes in the project browser and install them that way. So that's how we still have to connect a number of the dots, but even that work um, is shaping up quite nicely, uh, thanks to uh, Adam uh, and others. Um, and then you can start thinking of um, Starshot as a set of recipes, you know, opinionated curated recipes that are essentially uh, are going to be maintained uh, for the target audience uh, of uh, Starshot, um, you know, along with, you know, various other improvements that we can make uh, to core as well as to some of the contributed modules that these recipes will pull in, uh, so to speak. Um, all right, maybe I'll start with a few high level questions that have come up. Um, and then we'll dive into some of the more specific ones. But I think it would be useful, based on that initial question from Mathieu, uh, to talk a little bit about recipes versus install profiles. So maybe, um, you know, maybe somebody wants to jump in and clarify. I, I was going to tag Alex. All right, Alex. Alex, it is. Sure. <laughs> thanks. Um, so, so the question was, um, was our recipes going to replace install profiles? Um, and the, the answer is kind of twofold. Uh, the short answer is no, that they're not going to replace install pro profiles. If you want to build an install profile, that functionality is not going away and is, and is not deprecated, uh, at all. So, so if you have built an install profile, that that's fine. Um, but what we're hoping is that people will tend to build rest site recipes rather than install profiles in the future um, for the reasons that uh, Jim outlined right up the front of the presentation. Um, it, it's 
after you know many years of maintaining an installed profile um, as part of the the Thunder team, um, one of the, the things that frustrates us is that we can't easily uh, leverage commerce in the Thunder uh, install profile unless we build out a whole thing extending, uh, building on top of commerce and providing a Thunder commerce module. We can't just uh, use the commerce kickstart uh, starter because that itself is another install profile and they don't mix and match they, they can't be merged together um and there's there's a issue i think with i think over 500 comments on and a whole follow-up issue to try and make install profiles depend like be able to be applied to the same site and it's just a very complicated issue and we're trying to well we are we're sidestepping that whole discussion by building something that is meant to be composed from the ground up um with recipes so I I think in the future we will see less install profiles, um, and maybe at some point in the future we will decide that uh, that that we don't want to do it that way anymore. But uh, yeah, the two the two aren't exclusive, but the, it is possible to now have a Drupal site without an install profile. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, have a a, a a site built on standard, um, and you go to the uninstall page on Drupal 10.3, you will be able to uninstall standard if certain conditions are met. Yeah, I, I would say also like Drupal created the notion of install profiles. I don't even know how long ago, 15 years ago or something. And I think we've learned a lot in these 15 years, you know, by building distributions. And in, in a way I think about recipes as install profiles 2.0 and not, maybe not entirely right to say but we've learned so many things and so many of the learnings i think like we would implement differently today and the way we've the way they're implemented in recipes um you know it's just better <laughs> um in many ways so um, and Bob McDonald has asked, will the core install profiles become recipes? Well, we already have converted standard and uh, there was a question about minimal the recipe. And in some ways you can argue that um, minimal the recipe is just like the content types from standard without all the other stuff um, or like one of the content types or none of the content types. And you know, it's, it's it, I'm not sure whether minimal will ever become a recipe because you might just, it's, it's if you don't need any uh, anything, then you don't need a recipe. <laughs> it's, it's 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 one of those strange things. Minimal is so minimal that it's it's you're you're probably just going to be selecting some other recipes that fit your functionality more than what minimal does. Because minimal is supposed to just provide a base where you can start from. But if that if by selecting a couple of recipes you get that base, what's the point of minimal? Um, so. Yeah, well, I, I would say that in fact the the standard profile that the, that we provide has has already become a recipe, and yeah, we've we've done that. A couple of questions, um, Adam, Alex, Jim, about I think Nora asked, um, you know, where do recipes live, so to speak, and then Pierre, Paul asked in the Q and A, like, do we plan to integrate recipes in Project Browser? So maybe it's useful to talk a little bit about where recipes come from, so to speak. Um, is that, or you want, I, is that a helpful question? I can try and answer it if yeah. you guys don't, but. I was gonna tag Fina Proxima. Uh, <laughs> done. Revenge, um, okay. Well, where recipes come from current, so I have a merge request against Project Browser that I've been hacking on nonstop for the last week. And what it basically does is it shows like any recipes that you already have installed. So example, like if you install the, stall, uh, the, the Starshot prototype, you'll have a bunch of recipes there in the file system already. And those would be, as of this merge request, when it gets merged, those would be visible to Project Browser. So any recipes that you haven't started out with, additional ones, like maybe multilingual support or commerce or something, um, you'd be able to see those and apply them in Project Browser. Um, you know, there's no way yet to like discover recipes that are not on your computer. And the reason for that, so is because like Drupal, uh, the D.0 doesn't yet have an API, like an HTTP API to, to show those. 
they're working, the DA I'm pretty sure is working on that actively as part of this. Um, and then Packagist, there was, there is a merge request against Project Browser to show recipes that are just floating around on Packagist of which there really aren't that many. The only problem with Packagist is it doesn't give us, it just doesn't have anywhere near the amount of information available about a given recipe that D.O. would have. So you, you can do it. It just looks kind of pathetic, honestly, in Project Browser, where it's like, oh, I don't know, zero installs. I don't know. I don't have a description. I don't have an image. Um, so, you know, and that being said, Project Browser is pluggable. So if you wanted to show recipes, I, this came up in the Q&A, um, if you wanted to show recipes that existed like in, you know, an organization's GitHub or something, you could write a Project Browser source plugin to do that, to show those recipes in Project Browser. Um, I think that would absolutely be possible. I don't know if it'll happen in Project Browser itself, but someone will write a module for it. Um, you know, and you could do you could do that any any number of ways. So I'd say, you know, the main place recipes will come from um, is D.O. And that's what should ultimately be the main source of recipes in Project Browser. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. And I would add, um, for me, looking at this through the lens of Starshot, like for me, V1 of Starshot could be some hard-coded recipes, frankly, like, you know, 20, 30 yeah. recipes that we just ship. Yeah. V2 could be, we have, um, you know, the community can create recipes on Drupal.org and they become available to Project Browser. And we're actually very close to V2 probably, uh, which is great. Um, and then, yeah, as Adam said, um, there's also a world where organizations can have their own internal recipes and they can be made available as well. Like you could imagine a university, they may have a set of standard recipes, maybe that come with their default um design system or look and feel or that install default roles that they would like to have or whatever it is that an organization may like to see on all of their websites, maybe things that have been approved by security department or compliance department, like all of these could be made available as well as recipes. And so internal best practices, really, uh, if you want to think about it that way. So um, yeah. So whether it's hard coded through project browser, community sourced, internal to an organization, I think all of these are, are, uh, well, you know, will be options. Um, let's see. There was another. Um, so I think we, that covers actually a number of the questions. Um, There's a question about how to create recipes and the best way to start them. I feel like that was answered throughout the presentation with links to examples and documentation. Um, yeah, to continue on that, uh, someone asked, any plan to allow to export entire sites as recipes? Um, at this point, no. Um, we have that idea on a phase three roadmap to help you create recipes, but now get to know and love your configuration. Um, the validation messages when you do make mistakes are getting better and better. Um, but yeah, it's uh, use the examples that we have, use the examples in core um, and recipes will continue to evolve. Um, so uh, there have been some discussions uh, in the features module issue queue, um, but uh, I don't think anybody's worked on it yet. Because the that's basically what the features module has become in in Drupal eight is a way to export groups of configuration. And also the maintainer um, for the Drupal code generator, which is part of Drush DC, um, it's called DC, DCG, and I think the maintainer is called uh, Chi or Chai. Um, they often um, add new things really quickly to Drupal code generator. So I wouldn't be surprised that recipes just magically appear there and you'll be able to generate recipes using Drush and it'll ask you what modules do you want to install and what config actions and it'll be amazing because generally it, their work is incredible. All right, let's see if there's any uh, open questions here. Um, maybe, maybe the question that came in just now from Andre could be a good one. It says Adam and Andre have been chatting about the ability to make decisions in a recipe. Uh, this was kind of touched upon in the in the presentation. 
but he gives the example, uh, like it may be valuable for things like, you know, would you like to install the demonstration data or contents? And this would help make it easy for beginners rather than asking them to apply another recipe. Any thoughts on, on that? I do, but I already shared them um, in in chat and I think in the Q and A. So I guess if Alex or feel Jim free to re that. yeah, feel free to repeat it too. I don't know if everybody paid attention to all the Q and A in chat, but maybe they did. Well, I didn't, so okay. you can repeat for me, Adam. <laughs> I mean, what? So the idea of recipes making, like taking input and making decisions are two sort of separate things. So like taking input is definitely something that we want because it's like the example that we've heard is like, if you have a recipe that wants to install Google Tag Manager or something else that needs an API key, there's no way for the recipe to guess what that is. It has to be able to ask you, hey, what's your API key so that I can actually get set up here. Um, and that's that's something we have an issue for and we that's we're gonna do that, we need that. Um, recipes making decisions is maybe a little bit, I'm not like, may, that's a little bit, um, scary, honestly, and not, it might not be the most desirable thing. And here's the reason for that. Um, I can definitely see the use of like, if you have a recipe being applied, being, a, being prompted, oh, do you want to install the demo content? Do you want this? Do you want that? And I understand why that's friendly and why that's a useful wizard. The problem is kind of the devil's in the details with that one, because recipes, as we mentioned, are composable. They build on top of each other to infinite depth, right? Like a recipe, like even if you look at the core standard recipe, like it uses like 20 other recipes, and then those can use more recipes. And those guys can use, it's recipes all the way down. And if at some point in that chain, we're making a decision about if something's doing something a little differently, then all the guys on top of it can no longer rely on this one guy doing his job the same way. And that could that could just, that can break the Jenga tower. Um, so again, not saying it's a, not saying it's a no hard no or a bad idea, just it's dangerous. And the recipes were really designed as I see it to be super dumb. Um, they just do, it's like, here is what I want you to do. You will just do these things and you will throw an exception if you have a problem at any point here. And that means they operate on the principle of least surprise. They're really predictable. It's like you apply a recipe. If I applied this recipe successfully, I got all of this stuff that the recipe promised me and all of its recipes promised me. Um, so decision-making, Alex uses choose your own adventure as the metaphor there. It's, I mean, I'm traumatized from like lightning, working on lightning and trying to write update paths that way. And um, am I allowed to say the word shit show? Because... I guess I just did. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't good. So that's that's where I come to. That's how, that's where I come to this from. Um, logic decision making is dangerous when we let computers do it. I, I think uh, it's, I th I th I ahead, think it's really great to hear Adam say all those things because it's like, oh, all these years of talking to Adam has really, has really paid off. He's he's got it. <laughs> all the discussions on 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 uh, install profile inheritance have born have born much fruit um i think the specific question that, that andre is getting out there about demonstration demo content and stuff might end up in its own kind of special case um because if if a recipe wants to provide a load of demo content and make it easy to uninstall that might be something that we will facilitate because it, it it might be something that the product managers are very keen for us to do i think if we look at the way that umami has helped people really demonstrate the power of Drupal. And and one of the reasons it, it does that is because it provides demo content that you know you get a, a really working living site straight up. I think if you were building a site recipe and you didn't ship that kind of content, um, then it would be problematic. And it might be great if that same site recipe says this content is all demo content. And because of that, the system is able to provide a big button go like, build me the shell of this rather than the the, the, the demo of this. Um, but that's a very specific case um, and maybe just that one case. But uh, but everything that Adam is saying about recipes is supposed to be um, predictable and knowing exactly what they're going to do by, by looking at them and, and not uh, choosing uh, different pathways is 100% correct.
right now, I guess you could do that, right? By creating like a base recipe that installs the modules and does some configuration. And then you could have a second recipe that basically, you know, calls the first recipe and then does some things on top of that. For sure. But the UX of that might not be ideal in like project browser because then you have like two different things where it's really one thing with a checkbox <laughs> kind of thing, you know? Yeah, but, and yeah. it doesn't it doesn't easily provide that extra step of removing mm -hmm. said content, the demo mm -hmm. content. So I, I do th I I mean I, I think in discussions with um Gabo, like uh, I know that he's was extremely keen that recipes have the ability to provide content and the main driver for him for that was uh was for demo content but I, I actually think it was also important for other reasons the reasons that, that Jim gave during the presentation of being able to provide a set of terms that you know are going to be there um because you know terms sit in that world between what one might consider uh, content and config or configuration and I think um, it's really great that recipes have have helped bring default content into core because that that use case of providing content which you, you for your site's purposes would be considered configuration um, is really good. Yeah, and this might be an area where, like, if we have user experience people on the on the on the Zoom, like, might be an area where you can help to, like, even you know, we talked about how how does one enter an API key, for example or like an email address when configuring a contact form. Like we haven't really figured out the UX for that, I, I don't believe, right? So wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to start with that and make sure it, it, you know, it is accepted, so to speak, by end users in terms of the experience. Um, so let's see, is there other questions that we have not really tackled? Um, I'd like to talk about uh narenda asked is there any recipes available for seo in starship so uh, yeah go ahead i was just thinking that all recipes in starshot will be configured for seo best practices but to have just a specific seo recipe is probably not the way that starshot is creating recipes like we're thinking of the user of the site the site builder the the feature itself so it's not broken into okay this recipe is going to you know set all the meta tags we need to set those meta tags with the feature that they're building so you know i think a properly configured recipe is going to deliver a fully usable site feature and that means that it's accessible and it is has SEO best practices you know, already configured in it. That's right. Yeah, and the thing that we need to do next is we need to define for Starshot, we need to define the recipes that we need. And that's the work that we're doing right now. And we hope to share, like there's, there's probably a, a short list of recipes that are pretty easy to identify because many sites need them, right? Um, an example could be, or maybe it's too simple of a recipe, but like a contact form, like a lot of sites need a contact form. So maybe there is a recipe in that. I don't, I don't know. It might be too simple as an example. Um, but we, we can very quickly define some recipes, I think. Um, and then we're going to do additional research on what other recipes we might want to provide. And before we can do that, we need to do a little bit more work on sort of the product strategy side of things. And we need to be really clear on who is Starshot for. And then based on that persona, what are the things that they're looking to do? What are the challenges or problems that they have? Um, and like we can go then define recipes for those things. So you should expect us to sort of announce, if you will, a list of recipes that we want to build. <clears throat> That's probably going to happen in two or three phases, starting with obvious ones and then, you know, less obvious ones maybe. And then we're hoping that different people in the community, yourselves included, can go help build those recipes. And hopefully in a very collaborative way with, you know, design and user experience testing, documentation writing, 
uh, if needed, all of these things. But that's coming next. We're kind of right now. We're kind of laying out all of the building blocks and getting you up to speed on the building blocks. In parallel, we're working on kind of identifying the list of recipes that we want to build, and hopefully, we'll be able to make some first announcements this week in terms of recipes we want to build. Any other questions? That you want to answer? They keep rolling in. It's good. Uh, can a recipe be applied twice, or to be more specific, do we track somewhere which recipes have been applied on a site? So recipes do not know if they are have been applied or not. Or you, you I can uh, I can speak to this a little bit. So the core core itself does not remember what recipes have been applied. Recipes, as far as it's concerned, are just a thing that happened, and I. I woke up and suddenly I had this new dress on. Um, but Project Browser will track them, but the only reason it will track them is because it needs to be able to show in a list of recipes which ones have I already done. So it's really just for, for user friendliness, um, not really for anything else. And I, I also think it's it's likely that to solve some of our recipe composability issues we are probably going to work on the ability for a recipe to tell if the site conforms to its expectations um so for example if i mean if we if you have a very low level recipe that provides like the administrator role um, at the moment we do have that recipe as part of standard and it provides like the admin role as exported config and that causes some problems because that that recipe can never be reapplied once the admin role has changed but it would be nice if that recipe itself could say hey i provide an admin role that has a role called administrator that has the admin admin flag set to true um, and that means that i'm good and you don't need to ask me any other question um but we have, but this is probably one of our main issues to to solve is how we make it easy to compose recipes like that recipe as, into a, a bigger thing, um, and that's one of the possible solutions. And so maybe at some point in the future, Project Browser um, will be able to have its list of stored recipes, but it will also be able to check whether the, the, the list of stored recipes, whether that your site still conforms to those recipes. Valerie asks another question about sort of the ambiguity, sorry, of recipes to that solve the same need. For example, he's, he or she says, I can immediately name three ways to implement a contact form. And uh, that that's true, and I can say, um, as a star Starshot product lead, like we're going to be opinion opinionated with the Starshot recipes. So we're going to work with experts and trying to find here's what we think is the best way to do contact forms. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It doesn't mean it's the best way for every scenario, but it's the way that we're going to recommend for the Starshot users. Um, I've also seen some early designs. Um, for project browser where, you know, when you click on a recipe, um, you can get a little bit of information about the recipe. And one of the bits of information is actually which modules it depends on. So if you're a little bit more of a Drupal expert, you could sort of introspect a recipe very easily. And you could say, oh, this contact form is built using the contact form module or this contact form recipes using web forms or something, you know? So we will we'll need to allow some discovery so people can, when there's competing recipes, it, sort of in the larger ecosystem of recipes, will allow people to inspect them a little bit and so they can make choices. Um, you know, more, more might be needed there, but obviously we're going to have many different people and organizations contribute recipes that kind of do the same thing. And historically, we've had the same problem with modules. 
And historically, it's not been a bad thing. You know, sometimes choice is good. Um, so I imagine there will be some of that. Um, and that we'll use same techniques for dealing with that. So like with modules, as you probably know, we track how many people have installed the module or how many sites the module is being used on. So we can do some quality be between quotes, metrics potentially for recipes too. Um, probably things to be figured out, but we're going to need to provide, you know, people help in terms of how do you differentiate between two recipes and which one might be best for me. So between things like screenshots, installation metrics, activity metrics, descriptions, <laughs> all of these things will hopefully be available for recipes. And again, as I said, Starshot itself will be opinionated too about what re recipes it recommends. Because again, we're very focused on the experience for people new to Drupal and like we don't necessarily want them to spend hours and hours trying to understand how do I implement a contact form and like how do I choose between these t ten different recipes for contact forms? So, and that that's why I said earlier, like for me, for V one, I'd be totally happy with a hard coded list of opinionated recipes because as soon as you allow anyone in the community to contribute recipes and make these available to a project browser that really literally opens up, you know, dozens and dozens of questions and challenges that we need to address. And they're all good ones. They're all things we want to address and solve, but it doesn't need to be part of the sort of initial release. Okay. All right. Maybe we can do a couple more questions before wrapping. I don't know. How are we feeling? I can stay and answer as many as people have. I mean, I'm going to have to jump off in like 10 minutes so I can maybe do one, maybe two. So Nora asks, there appears to be concerns about the effects of recipes on existing distributions. If there is a path to upgrade distros to a recipe format or in if install profiles will continue to be a thing for distros in general. I would say that that is completely up to the distribution maintainer to continue as they have been or change moving forward. So you wouldn't be able to change your existing distribution sites out in the wild, but you could uh, adopt a, a new branch and, and move forward. Um, Still, I think with distributions, a lot of, you know, from what I've heard, a lot of people who maintain install profiles and distributions want to have certain configurations untouchable by their sites, which is, you know, what goes against what recipes is all about. But if there are things that, you know, the distribution maintainers want to give the site owner and never touch again, you know, that's where recipes comes into play. So it'd be a tool in their toolkit. Yeah, that's that's very much how Thunder is 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 looking at it at the moment. Is like we we might have some long term plans to change Thunder into a recipe, but we, we probably are likely to break out small parts of Thunder functionality into into recipes, um, and then go from there. And and so it will enable us to share some of the things that are part of the distribution much uh, simpler. But also, you know, we don't we don't have to convert the whole thing first up. Um, because it would be a lot of work. Yeah, distribution maintainers are busy maintaining their distributions. And updating all of their contrib <laughs> modules that they are part of that to uh, support Drupal 11. It's no small task. Yeah. I think these are all amazingly good questions. And I think for me, like I think we have years and years of work and learning to do, even though recipes landed in core and we could give a great demo. Um, there's, like, there's just a lot to learn, <laughs> I think, on how we do things, how we promote recipes, how we, and it's exciting, you know? It's exciting to go through that learning and, and I'm sure we'll see this evolve over the years to come. There were some questions about config actions 
that Adam answered in the chat really quick, but contrib modules can extend what core has for config actions and create their own config actions. Um, so far, I don't think there's any examples of anybody doing that. Um, but you know, right now I use the simple config update uh, config action to update meta tag configuration. But you know, Damien could come along and make his own meta tag config action that, that shipped with the module, and you'd know it would be there because you'd have the module installed for that configuration. Um, so I think we're at the the tip of the iceberg there to what the contrib community could do with config actions, you know, in addition to all the uh, needs review tasks I mentioned uh, that people have been already adding on some pretty cool ideas for config actions. Also, if you are a contrib module maintainer that provides your own config entity type, so for example, the, the meta tag stuff or, um, I don't think of one right now off the top of my head, but there are loads, um, uh, commerce or whatever. Um, often your config entities will, or your config entity types will have interfaces with methods on, and those methods will map quite nicely to something that you would like to expose as a as a config action. For example, in core we have like the grant permission uh, method on uh, user roles, and that is a config action, um, but it's not specific. It doesn't have any code specifically uh, for to it to leverage that method as a config action that uses uh, PHP attributes. So you can just um, add a PHP attribute to your config entity method and that will turn it into a config action. Um, so that actually the the onus on contrib to add uh, action support to their config entities, especially if it's only uh, for a method that already exists is, is really small. Um, yeah, if you want, if you want to see how that works, have a look at the user role entity in Drupal ten three, and you'll see the attribute right there. I'm gonna have to drop in two minutes, and I hope, I hope that doesn't kill the Zoom. <laughs> in case you want to keep going, uh, the Zoom is provided by the DA, so assume they might be the host. Grease, I think there's one more question that maybe okay. maybe we can answer. do that one. Yeah. Recipe marketplaces and monetization appears to be on a lot of people's mm. minds. Is there any opposition to this idea? Mm, interesting question. Um probably requires a nuanced answer, but one we don't have like ev all the modules and themes that we have on Drupal.org are all open source. Like we do not allow sort of, you know, paid only modules or themes. And I don't see a future where we, where we would ask people to pay for recipes directly on Drupal.org. Now, at the same time, I would say organizations today, they kind of already use recipes um, or at least the, many organizations have a distribution of some kind that bundles their best practices as an uh, and when i say organizations i mean agencies you know a lot of agencies have a starting point that they built um for starting to build new projects and so i imagine agencies will use recipes for that and there's not a requirement to open source these recipes and in a way when you go with an agency i guess maybe you're paying for those recipes so i, I think it's okay that way um, but like directly selling recipes on Drupal.org is, um, yeah, not going to happen, I would say, you know, but using recipes as starting points for customer projects without open sourcing them, that seems fine. There's no obligation to make recipes uh, available on Drupal.org. So I don't know if that answers your question, Nora, uh, but we'll have a marketplace of recipes on D.O. Yes. And... I believe all of these recipes will be open source uh, on Drupal.org. Great answer. Uh, third third party marketplaces, uh, she adds. Um, yeah, maybe maybe somebody will do that, but um, 
of you know i think i would it's probably an interesting legal question but um i would think that a recipe probably is a der derivative work uh, and therefore it will be subject to the gpl v2 and so that what that would mean is somebody can create a third party marketplace but one person could buy the recipe and then open source it because you're basically asking somebody to pay for what is legally open source that we would have to double check that i think because a recipe is kind of a new thing but I, historically the definition has been if it runs in the same memory space uh, as an open source application then it is also open source and this is just basically calling Drupal APIs and running as part of the Drupal runtime. So therefore, I I believe it would be um, automatically GPL, a recipe. So yeah, you could sell GPL code. It's not illegal as long as you allow others to share what they bought from you uh, under terms of the GPL. So it would only take one person to open source a proprietary between quotes recipe. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but based on uh, you know 25 years of open source experience, that would be my interpretation. Uh, so subject to verification and validation. I'd prefer if people shared their open source recipes so we could all learn from them. Exactly. We're an open source project. We want to act in a spirit of open source. So that's why we won't allow commercial recipes on drupal.org i think just doesn't make that much sense to me but great question it's something we'll have to provide more clarity on so good i do have to drop unfortunately but i think maybe this might be a good wrap um well, i'm sure we'll do additional sessions in the future um but yeah very exciting stuff a uh, big thank you to jim and alex and adam uh, for you know working on this this has been in the works for over two years believe it or not um you know alex started thinking about this long time ago and uh, has been working on it with others diligently and now it's coming to life and as i said in other webinars no pun intended the stars are starting to align with project browser recipes automatic updates and uh, we're going to be able to do some pretty amazing things and we need your help you know, there's a lot of work to be done to fine tune recipes, to figure out how to implement the questions that you asked and to bring it all together in a way that makes sense for new users. So, and hopefully based on this Zoom meeting, you know how to get involved. And uh, we look forward to um, your participation. So thank you all. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next Zoom meeting later this week. Uh, well, and we'll talk about um, automatic updates and how that ties into uh, Starshot. So thank you for attending. Thank you for participating and uh, look forward to your collaboration. Thank you all. Thanks, Trace.